Tonight on Quest, wind energy is the fastest growing source of power in the United States, but wind turbines can be deadly to birds. Now, biologists say there's a way to reduce bird deaths. And concussions are surprisingly common for athletes. What happens during a concussion? And what can be done to prevent brain damage? And there's a hidden danger in San Francisco Bay that's poisoning wildlife and people. Learn how mercury pollution got here and what's being done to get rid of it. Support for Quest is provided by the National Science Foundation, the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, Hope Lab, the David B. Gold Foundation, the Dirk and Charlene Cabsonell Foundation, the Vedez Family Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, and the Smart Family Foundation. Support is also provided by the members of KQED. Quest is a project of KQED Science. In the Alameda and Contra Costa Hills, the Altamont Pass is home to hundreds of bird species. They hunt and play in the midst of 3,000 wind turbines. Those turbines can be deadly, especially to golden eagles. There's an eagle oh, right eagle, there. Eagle, oh, eagle, eagle. Right here, flying okay. low. Below the horizon, right in front of the Biologists tower. Doug Bell, Sean Smallwood, and Joe DiDonato study golden eagles. It's got white in its tail, which means it's a subadult or a younger bird. It's characteristic of a golden eagle is that the birds have white at the base of the tail and white in the wings in their earlier years to about the third or fourth year. In the Altamont um, Pass Wind Resource Area is, is, is within and adjacent to one of the densest nesting populations of golden eagles in the world. Golden eagles are protected under federal law. It's illegal to kill a single eagle without a permit. According to Alameda County estimates, 35 golden eagles were killed by the Altamont's turbans in 2013. Scientists call the Altamont a population sink. Their population's going down the drain. The Altamont is killing more eagles than the local population can reproduce. So it's taking out more youngsters than they can produce and replace themselves with. That appears to be what happened to this young eagle. The primary injury on this bird is the left wing. There's an amputation at the carpal joint. The carpal bone is shattered. At the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in Sacramento, Krista Rogers is performing a necropsy similar to a human autopsy. We describe this as blunt force trauma, which is consistent with a wind turbine strike given the location where the bird was found. Researchers knew the bird well. The transmitter is going to stay on here about three years. She was one of 18 golden eagles, like this one, that Bell and DiDonato are following through radio transmitters. Go. Four of them have died after hitting turbines, but not before revealing some very useful information. One of the more valuable things that we've learned from our transmitters that we've placed on eagles is that they use the Altamont a lot. So that really means that everything they do out there is going to have an effect on golden eagles. Shortly after the Altamont's wind farms opened in the 1980s, scientists discovered that hundreds of birds of prey were being killed there each year. The Altamont was sort of seen as a black eye for renewable energy because anytime someone was proposing a new wind farm, they would raise the specter of the Altamont Pass. In 2005, chapters of the Audubon Society and other environmental groups took legal action to get wind companies to protect birds here. So the companies agreed to remove portions of their turbine fleets from 2006 to 2018 when they would turn off all of their old turbines. We wanted to move towards getting the old turbines out of the Altamont Pass because in a process called repowering, up to 30 old turbines can be replaced with one single new turbine which then results usually in significantly less bird mortality. All of the turbines in this wind farm, about 300 in total, have been turned off in preparation for repowering. 
Soon, they'll be replaced by just 10 turbines. It's time to pull the old machines down and put new ones up. Rick Miller works for EDF Renewable Energy, the California-based company that owns the wind farm. He says the repowering process will cost $35 million and will be partly offset by federal production tax credits for wind energy. Ten turbines like this one will produce enough electricity to power 12,000 California homes for a year. The turbines are becoming much larger, uh, much larger rotor diameters and much taller towers. So we've really been able to reduce the number of turbines required to produce a tremendous amount of energy. And that means there aren't as many for birds to hit. Companies can also place the turbines more strategically. Scientists believe fewer turbines and better placement are key to protecting wildlife. 300 meters. Ecologist Sean Smallwood has been studying birds in the Altamont since the late 1990s. He advises companies on where to put their turbines to minimize bird deaths. This wind farm called Buena Vista, or Beautiful View, was one of the first to be repowered. That was seven years ago. At Buena Vista, the repowering that happened there was very effective, I think. Uh, it probably reduced avian fatalities by about 80% or better. This is where the old turbines were. And this is also where the burrowing owls nest. And so fatality rate was pretty high. When we repowered, we put the new turbines up on the top of the hill where the burrowing owls are not. So our burrowing owl fatality rate dropped to zero three years of monitoring, that's why. Smallwood says that when the Altamont was first built, wind energy companies installed over 7,000 turbines, more than twice as many as there are today. They gave little consideration to bird safety. Those are the most dangerous turbines in the Altamont Pass on record. There's one 120 kilowatt turbine down there, now removed, but it's on record as having killed one eagle per year for 10 years. And the reason is because there's a lot of eagle traffic through the low spots of the Altamont Pass. The birds fly lower in some areas to avoid wind resistance and to hunt for ground squirrels. Golden eagles have keen eyesight, which is good for hunting prey, but it doesn't help the birds detect wind turbines, especially when they're focused on other things. Social interactions are very important. So an eagle responding to other eagles, chasing each other around or chasing some other birds, these are dangerous social interactions that lead up to what we call events, near misses. The federal government has recently stepped up enforcement of laws aimed at protecting golden eagles. It's prosecuted two wind companies whose turbines killed golden eagles in Wyoming. The prosecution of those two companies certainly sent a message to companies across the country. There is incentive there to come in and work with us. That incentive is new permits, which allow wing companies to kill a small number of golden eagles each year. We approach the permits as a positive step, which might seem a little counterintuitive. For example, why would Audubon be okay with giving people permission to kill birds? Before it was sort of chaos, there was no real regulation, there was no real enforcement, and we know birds were getting killed in large numbers. Now we can actually keep track of that, we can hold people accountable, and we can take steps to remedy the problem. With repowering and a greater understanding of bird behavior, scientists and environmental groups hope there can be more clean energy with fewer bird deaths. Every autumn, more than a million high school football players rumble onto fields across the nation, ready to muscle and claw their way into the end zone. But in the pursuit of victory, risk abounds. Joseph Redman played in dozens of football games for Marin Catholic High School, but there was one game during his sophomore year he will never forget. The uh, opposite player was running full speed at me. I was running full speed at him, and when we collided, we went head to head, and we both hit the ground pretty hard. I remember opening my eyes and seeing this green fluorescent light. It really scared me. And I took my helmet off. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know why I was even at a football game. Joe was rushed to the emergency room, where he was diagnosed with a concussion a brain injury experienced by millions of people each year in the U.S., especially while playing contact sports. 
What happens in a concussion is you have some sort of traumatic blow to the head or a rapid acceleration deceleration of the head. And the brain hits these bony structures inside of the skull and that causes damage to occur. And this damage can cause symptoms such as a loss of consciousness, loss of memory, headache, nausea, dizziness, blurred vision. In 2015, a new California law took effect to help cut the risk of concussions for middle and high school football players by limiting full contact practice to twice per week. A student who sustained a concussion must also wait at least a week before returning to play. But it's not just male athletes who are at risk for concussions. Female athletes playing contact sports are also vulnerable to these head injuries. Gabriela Fernandez, a classmate of Joe's, suffered a concussion during volleyball practice. I was going for one of the balls and I kind of like slipped and hit my head forward on the ground. And I felt like kind of dizzy, but I didn't think it was anything to worry about at first. I went back to practice, I think a week later, and then the symptoms started getting worse and I couldn't really concentrate. The headaches were probably the worst part and I noticed myself getting a lot slower. I didn't really know too much about concussions. I thought to get a concussion, you'd have to be like completely knocked out. The test you're about to take is actually the exact same test that every single NFL player has to take. Eric Freitag is a neuropsychologist in Walnut Creek, California, who helps dozens of athletes get back on track each year after suffering concussions. My role in the treatment of an athlete is to objectively measure through testing how their brain is functioning in order to determine the severity of a concussion and also to monitor recovery. One of the tests that I give is called the impact test. And the athletes will take it before their sports season begins. Should that athlete have a concussion injury, we can then use their baseline test and have them take the same test after their injury that allows us to make an apples to apples comparison. The test is a tough mental workout. What the impact test measures is common areas of brain function that are affected after a concussion, like memory. Not only verbal memory, but visual memory. It also measures reaction time and processing speed. Joe first took the test before the start of football season. He then took it again after his helmet-to-helmet -helmet hit. So here we have your baseline right here, right? Mm -hmm. Perfect. It looks just fine. Shows your verbal memory and verbal processing, 94th percentile. That's very, very high average. And then boom, the concussion happens. You take the test three days later, and look what happens to your verbal memory. That's less than first percentile. So wow. severely impaired. If we didn't have this test, we would not have known that your brain was still injured. A concussion, by definition, is a mild traumatic brain injury. Although there is no cure for it, symptoms resolve in a week to 10 days for most people. But for some, recovery can take months or longer. If I were to play another year, I could just, I don't know, I could, uh, uh, lost it. Concussions can happen at any age, but kids are particularly vulnerable to their harmful effects because their brains are still developing. There's a subset of these individuals, at least 15%, that go on to have persistent problems. These aren't simply just having your bell rung. These are life-changing events. The symptom that has stayed with me is uh, trying to find words in uh, sentences. Traumatic brain injury and concussions in general are a major public health issue in this country. There are at least 2.5 million documented head injuries every year, and we estimate in upwards of 4 to 5 million concussions every year. Dr. Jeffrey Manley is the chief of neurosurgery at San Francisco General Hospital, where he and his team treat more than 1,000 traumatic brain injuries each year. But even a mild traumatic brain injury, such as a concussion, is a challenge to treat given the complexity of the human brain. 
Brain injury is one of the most complicated injuries in the most complicated organ in the body. The brain is an organ of functional connectivity, and for it to work right, all the parts have to work together. Think about the brain like an electronic machine. If you start removing some of the wires, it may not work so well. And so if we have an injury to the wiring of the brain, say for example between the memory and the learning portions, it's really not a far stretch to understand if those areas are disconnected that they're no longer going to function in the same way again. In 2010, Dr. Manley led a team of researchers to track 600 concussion patients for six months after their injuries. The study showed the value of using magnetic resonance imaging to detect damage to the wiring of the brain. For traumatic brain injury today, CT scanning is still the gold standard. But when we use an MRI scan, we begin to see abnormalities that we cannot see on a CT scan. We begin to see microbleeds, and when you have many of these microbleeds, your processing speed slows down. In fact, MRI scans revealed brain microbleeds and bruising in 27% of the patients who otherwise had normal CT scans. And what's interesting and important about this finding is these patients with these abnormalities on their MRI scan uh, really took much longer to recover and did worse by three months. They had difficulty concentrating. They had difficulty returning to work. In 2013, Dr. Manley got funding to expand the study by recruiting 3,000 traumatic brain injury patients across the U.S. Just like with heart disease and cancer, we need new imaging tools. We need blood tests to help to guide us. We need to understand what the genetics are. And then this way we can develop a more personalized approach to the treatment because there's no one size fits all for something as complicated as a brain injury. Dopamine, one of the major neurotransmitters, is very important for brain function. Recently, we have identified a variant in a gene in the dopamine pathway, and what we found is that patients with this variant do much worse from traumatic brain injury than those that don't have this variant. We're looking at a blood test that tells us whether you have or have not had a traumatic brain injury. That will really facilitate more rapid care and really get patients to the right person at the right time. Until then, the impact of one concussion may be enough for athletes like Joe to avoid the risk of another brain injury. No one told me that I didn't have to play football. I just ultimately thought that it just wasn't worth it to go through another one of those concussions again. As we move forward with traumatic brain injury and concussion, I hope to really better define this so that we can tell patients, yes, you can return to play, or no, it would really be better if you didn't return to play because we've observed other people like you that didn't do so well. I'm very hopeful and excited for the future. I believe that with this precision medicine approach, we can have the same kind of success that we've had in heart disease and cancer with traumatic brain injury. It's striped bass and halibut season in the San Francisco Bay, and piers are full of people casting for a catch. I'm fishing for sea bass. Usually I fish out here for halibut, striped bass. Yeah, there's halibut out here. I'll definitely eat halibut. What these anglers at the Berkeley Pier may not know is that their tasty meal might not be as healthy as they think. Some of the fish they're hauling in are loaded with a hefty dose of mercury. Larger fish, those apex predators such as the swordfish, shark, ahi, albacore, sea bass, large halibut, all these large fish live a long time and eat other fish. So mercury will accumulate in the aquatic system. This naturally occurring metal is toxic when it enters the food chain and can cause permanent damage to the central nervous system. It's neurotoxic to developing brains. So pregnant nursing mothers, small children, babies should not consume mercury on a regular basis or at all. Any exposure to mercury is not good, but when you've got concentrations of mercury at the level that they are in San Francisco Bay, it's problematic for both the wildlife that eats the fish out of the bay and also for the people who are consuming those fish. Sejal Choksi is with San Francisco Baykeeper, an environmental group that advocates for aggressive mercury cleanup in the bay. 
We're going to do a little patrol today down on the waterfront. Mercury is prevalent. It's throughout the whole system, um, but you can't see it. Because of its potency and highly changeable nature, mercury poses unique challenges to monitoring and cleanup efforts. Mercury is really poisonous at low concentrations, and so to measure it accurately, you have to make sure that you don't contaminate the sample. Russ Flegel and his team of scientists from the University of California, Santa Cruz, are measuring the pervasiveness of mercury throughout the bay. Mercury is the only element that exists as a liquid at room temperature but it also exists in a gaseous form. Mercury is found primarily in a red rock known as cinnabar. When it settles in waterways, bacteria transform it into a form known as methylmercury. That's the kind that Flegel is most concerned about. Methylmercury is highly toxic and is easily absorbed by tiny aquatic organisms. Methylmercury is picked up in plants and is picked up in the organisms that eat the plants. And as you move up the food chain to bigger and bigger organisms, you get more and more mercury. In wildlife, mercury in high concentrations can cause developmental problems, just as it does in humans. You can have issues where eggs don't hatch, fetuses don't develop properly, you have birth defects. If you've got mercury impairing wildlife and their immune systems, then they're more susceptible to infectious diseases. They can have cancerous growths. It's pretty much the same as in the human population. Few would suspect that this poisonous element is also at the root of California's history and prosperity. In the 19th century, mercury was used extensively in the gold rush, and the best place to find mercury was in the cinnabar-rich hills just south of San Jose, in a town called New Almaden. What is unique of this mine was there was no other working mercury mine anywhere in North America. To extract mercury, crushed ore was heated in furnaces and transformed into a vapor. As the gas cooled and condensed, it turned into a liquid form known as quicksilver. Mercury is naturally attracted to gold, and Sierra miners put it to work separating the precious metal from crushed rock. By the early 1900s, miners had switched to cyanide to extract gold, but mercury still had many uses in industry, medicine, dentistry, and common household products. Most mining operations are short-lived, the ore runs out, but this was mined from 1845 until 1976. All that mining left behind a legacy in the form of mercury waste. Rocky deposits from the old furnaces are leaching mercury into the creeks and rivers that are part of the South Bay's Guadalupe River watershed. Mercury-tainted sediment can also be found throughout the Sierra Nevada, San Pablo Bay, and the Delta. Their contaminated waters all drain into San Francisco Bay. The problem with mercury is it's not just a historic pollutant. It is the major inorganic environmental pollutant being put into the environment now. Mercury travels through the air, too. It drifts in emissions from local oil refineries and cement kilns, and large quantities also come from coal-burning power plants in China. Mercury is also in wastewater and in stormwater runoff. Bruce Wolf is with the Regional Water Quality Control Board. It's the state agency that oversees water pollution in the Bay Area. We're concerned about mercury down into the part per billion range, a drop of water in a backyard swimming pool is about a part per billion. And so even a thermometer or what's in a fluorescent bulb is a significant amount. Roughly 2,000 pounds of mercury enter bay waters every year from all these different sources. The bay is slowly cleaning itself, washing 3,100 pounds a year out to sea. But because so much has built up over time, it needs a helping hand. To speed up the process, in 2008, the regional board launched the largest effort ever to clean up toxic pollution in the Bay. So far, the plan has reduced wastewater runoff, and erosion control is stemming the flow of old mine waste into the Bay. 
But not all of the board's efforts to control inflows have been successful, and only time can wash the toxic sediment from the bay's mud. In the meantime, mercury levels in fish and wildlife remain as high as ever. At a minimum, three generations will be impacted by the potent and long-lasting poison still lingering in the bay mud. It may take more than 100 years for the bay to recover, but environmental groups say that's too long to wait for cleaner waters. The San Francisco Bay should be a resource for the community. It's not a place that should be allowed to be contaminated and polluted. So whatever we can do to clean up the contamination in the Bay as fast as possible is what we should be doing. Support for Quest is provided by the National Science Foundation, the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, Hope Lab, the David B. Gold Foundation, the Dirk and Charlene Cabsonell Foundation, the Vadez Family Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, and the Smart Family Foundation. Support is also provided by the members of KQED. Quest is a project of KQED Science. A KQED television production.